Hey everyone, it's time for another installment in this series exposing all the frauds at Discovery Institute. Today we have our first repeat honoree as we revisit Gunter Beckley. You may recall that after part one on Casey Luskin, Beckley was tasked with a damage control in the form of three consecutive hit pieces on me for their pathetic blog, Evolution News. And the first piece I made on Beckley focused in part on debunking all the lies he told in those. Well, part two of this series was a devastating vivisection of Stephen Meyer. And guess who got the assignment? Our favorite German fraud once more. This time, three blog posts simply would not do. He needed eight garbage essays, and boy are they stupid. How stupid, you ask? Let's jump in and I'll show you. Here's the first one, a hit piece that pretends my debunk is a hit piece, which does almost nothing except whine about how mean I am. There is the typical ad hominem regarding credentials up top, and then he immediately complains about my 100% accurate usage of words like pseudoscience and charlatans, which factually and undeniably describe everyone at the DI and everything they say. Don't forget the classic Hitler reference, even though Christians seem to repeatedly forget he was one of them. And then we are on to the pearl clutching. Dave is so mean. Don't worry, we censored some of the horrible potty language so you don't have to read it and have your face melt like it's the Ark of the Covenant. Naughty words are totally so much worse than lying for a living, am I right? For the record, I absolutely would make Meyer cry in a live exchange, and if you beg to differ, Stephen, you know where to find me. Seriously, what is wrong with this evil Satan man? Why won't he stop exposing our lies? It's not like anyone affiliated with the DI is an actual unhinged lunatic, right? Mr. Farina! Here! What do you want me? And of course, Dave is just parroting claims from other people who have thoroughly debunked us. Nothing to see. Certainly not a mountain of peer-reviewed science that contradicts everything Meyer says. Well, let's watch Beckley spin his wheels to deny all this science, just like Meyer did. He brings up transitional fossils, saying that evolutionists, which is not a word, expect anatomically intermediate fossils on branches or between clades, but not direct ancestor-to-descendant sequences, so not directly ancestral to any clade, while the creationist idea of a transitional fossil is just an ancestor-to-descendant sequence. Of course, we have many fossils that fit both categories. Beckley is just lying. We mentioned numerous examples in the Meyer video that fit the former category, And there are various diatoms, foraminifera, ammonites, conodonts, and other organisms that fit the latter category. But also, the fossils in the latter category fit into the former category. Creationists just try to arbitrarily deny a subset of transitional fossils to sound more credible. He also implies that I said that the fossil record shows a gradual and continuous development for all clades. This is idiotic. There are clades for which this is true, but it's far from true for all or even most clades. The fossil record is massively imperfect. Nobody has ever said otherwise. We don't need a fossil for every species that has ever existed to build a strong case for evolution. Beckley builds on this straw man to argue that the transitional sequences I cite, which are objectively transitional by his own description, are somehow not actually transitional because there are gaps in the fossil record. Let's pick each one apart now. For the reptile to mammal transition, Beckley comes right out and says they do form a transitional sequence. He then says the first pelicosaurs appear before the first therapsids, which appear before the first cynodonts, which appear before the first mammaliaformes. And that's exactly what we expect. It's a great example of phylogeny, or the pattern of evolutionary relatedness, matching with stratigraphy, or the order of the geological strata. A direct record of biological change over geologic time. Anyone who doesn't see that this is immaculate evidence for evolution is clueless or lying to themselves. You have to sort through his verbiage because he is packing everything with as much jargon as possible to confuse the science illiterate reader into assuming that he's right. But that's essentially all he's saying. Beckley states that since the fossils don't form a perfect continuous sequence, it's somehow not evidence for evolution. This is insane. There's no reason to expect phylogeny to match with stratigraphy if common descent isn't true. And if Beckley's perfectly fine with common descent, then why is he bringing it up? 
I know why, to toss out words like event, revolution, and big bang to imply, just as Meyer does with the Cambrian explosion, that all of these things appeared more rapidly than science can account for, which it doesn't, or biologists wouldn't hold the positions they do. Next, he brings up the fish to tetrapod transition and says it's all out of whack because the earliest evidence of a tetrapod, the Zakalmi tracks, date to 390 million years ago, which is older than Eusthenopteron and Pandirichthys. But the earliest tetrapod tracks are at least 20 million years younger than the earliest Sarcopterygians, or lobe finned fish, the clade that encompasses tetrapods, so there is no problem. Even though we don't have a perfect ancestor to descendant record for early tetrapods, we can still clearly see the morphological transition that occurred from advanced lobe finned fish to basal tetrapods. These are fossils that obviously fit with Beckley's first definition of transitional. Again, this is yet another very strong demonstration of evolution. Then for the amphibians, reptiles, birds transition, Beckley just straight up lies. He says, just as in early tetrapods, there is a well-known temporal paradox as shown by Fiducia, 1994-1996, with the earliest birds being older than their assumed stem group dinosaurs. Well, this is total horseshit. Archaeopteryx appeared 150.8 million years ago, but the first theropod dinosaurs appeared 231.4 million years ago. Birds are nested within the Paraves, which appeared at least 164 million years ago, based on Epidexipteryx, which is nested within Coelosauria, that dates to at least 166 million years ago, based on Proceratosaurus, and so on. Fiducia is 30 years out of date on this issue, and so is Beckley, who justifies his conclusion by citing himself. Very scholarly move there, Gunter. As for the terrestrial to aquatic whale transition, he accepts the beautiful transitional series of fossils, but says there isn't enough time for this transition to have occurred because it required a major re-engineering of the body plan within a single species. This is preposterous. We don't know that this transition occurred within a single species, and the whale body plan is the same body plan as that of every other chordate. So no, the body plan was not re-engineered at all. The appendages were modified. Remember that according to Meyer, the body plan equates with the phylum, so a single species can't change it. Uh-oh, Beckley didn't coordinate with Meyer well enough on that one. Finally, Beckley says there's a gap between the most primitive Homo and advanced Australopiths. The Australopith species considered most closely related to Homo is Australopithecus sediba, which has a cranial capacity of 420 to 440 cc. However, Homo habilis has a cranial capacity of at least 500 cc, so there's a morphological gap here. But this is merely a change in the relative sizes of existing bones, not the wholesale invention of new ones. Australopiths have all the bones that Homo have, and Australopiths appeared way earlier in the fossil record than Homo did. All Beckley can do is distort the facts to desperately poke holes in a fossil record that screams evolution at every turn. Moving on to the second article, Beckley pretends I am confused about the Cambrian explosion. He starts again with the straw man that evolution must necessarily be completely gradualistic. I don't argue that it is, and no modern evolutionary biologists do either. Then, Beckley pretends I contradicted myself by saying that the fossil record shows perfect gradualism, but also the fossil record is imperfect. That's nonsense. The fossil record shows gradual evolutionary change, but it is also imperfect. My point about the artifact hypothesis was that Meyer seems to argue the fossil record should be taken at face value, but the organisms we're looking for in the late Precambrian record are precisely those that would be the hardest to preserve. That's why essentially all of the fossil-bearing strata from the late Precambrian and early Cambrian are Lagerstaten, or exceptionally preserved strata. The organisms of that time period were mostly small and soft-bodied, which are the characteristics not conducive to fossilization. So sorry, these limitations immaculately explain the absence. Then he whines that no one takes evolution news seriously because it isn't peer-reviewed. 
Aw, but wait, they reference peer-reviewed research. Yeah, and exclusively lie about it. Every time they reference actual science, they're lying about it to pretend that their propaganda is science. You don't have to take my word for it. You can just ask the primary authors themselves, as I did for my Luskin debunk. They always emphatically confirm that DI members are completely mischaracterizing the research. Sorry, guys. Fail. Next, Beckley has to really misdirect his audience's attention because I pointed out that Stephen Meyer did actually say that animals first appeared in the Cambrian. Here's that clip again. Cambrian explosion, which is an event about 520 to 530 million years ago where the first animal forms arose abruptly in the fossil record with no discernible connection to similar forms in the lower Precambrian strata. It's really dramatic. First animal forms, first animal forms, first animal forms. Beckley first says this is just a pedantic distinction, because who cares about facts? But then also says, Meyer never disputes the existence of Precambrian metazoans, such as sponges and cnidarians. Which is it, Gunter? Did Meyer really say the Cambrian is the first appearance of animals, as you can see in the video, or did he not say that? Then more misdirection about how long the Cambrian explosion was. He says he agrees that the explosion was at least 25 million years, not Myers 10, and then cites two papers that say the period with the main pulse of diversification was about 10 million years long. The first paper is Boring et al., published in 1993, and the snippet Beckley provides is a blatantly dishonest quote mine. Let's take a look at the full section. Analyses of the Cambrian faunal radiation indicate that diversification followed a logistic pattern of increase. Our calibration shows that the initial interval of slow diversification followed the Ediacaran faunal epoch by no more than 20 million years and lasted approximately 14 million years. In contrast, if we accept the age of 525 million for the adabanian batomian boundary, then the tomotion adabanian period of exponential increase of diversification lasted only 5 to 6 million years. In any event, it is unlikely to have exceeded 10 million years. To paraphrase, Boring characterizes the radiation of the Cambrian explosion as a whole as having a logistic pattern with a slow lead-up of 14 million years and a phase of exponential increase of about 5 to 6 million years, or less likely 10 million years. This would mean that the Cambrian explosion lasted 20 to 25 million years in total. But even regarding the exponential phase that Beckley wants to cherry-pick, note that they accept an age of 525 million years for the Adabanian and Batomian boundary. This is the terminology commonly used by the Siberian platform. More common names for the subdivision of the Cambrian period that correlate with Timotian and Adabanian are stage 2 and stage 3, respectively. The adabanian batomian boundary, or more commonly known as the boundary between Cambrian stage 3 and stage 4, is dated closer to 514 million years ago. The date for the base of the Timotian, or stage 2, is dated to 529 million years ago, and the base of the Cambrian is dated to 538 million years ago. So Bowring's logistic pattern of the Cambrian radiation would span about 24 million years, starting with a slow lead-up phase lasting for 9 million years, followed by an exponential phase lasting for 15 million years. Naughty, naughty, Gunter. Lies by omission are still lies. Then Beckley cites Irwin et al. 2011, stating that 13 phyla appear in Cambrian Stage 3. However, the supplementary figures S2 and S3 show that 12 phyla appeared in Cambrian Stage 3, while 13 phyla appeared prior to this, with 2 phyla appearing in the Ediacaran, 6 in Cambrian Stage 1, and 5 in Cambrian Stage 2. Then again, this rather wide distribution doesn't matter to Beckley. He has arbitrarily decided to narrow his view onto the shortest 10 million year period, during which the diversification rate was the highest, because reasons. But the Cambrian explosion isn't just the period of greatest diversification, as I showed. The Cambrian explosion occurred in two phases, lasting way, way more than 10 million years. 
Beckley moves on to this topic next and claims that this fact is somehow irrelevant because the Cambrian explosion has nothing to do with the radiation of animal phyla, according to him. This is both arbitrary and not in line with what most experts of the Cambrian describe. On one hand, the exact time span we use to define the Cambrian explosion is arbitrary because the real issue is when and how clades or organisms actually arose, not the particular label we put upon them. But also, as mentioned previously, Cambrian researchers say the radiation lasted for tens of millions of years, citing the radiations of various organisms through the latest Ediacaran and Cambrian. Beckley says the problem the Cambrian imposes is that lots of complex body plants appear out of nowhere, but as we showed in the Meyer video, that isn't at all the case. Early arthropods, velvet worms, and tardigrades were much more like each other in the Cambrian than they are today. The diversification was gradual, which we expect under evolution, and they are preceded in the record by simpler bilaterians in the earlier Ediacaran. The fact that we don't have every fossil in this sequence doesn't make these facts go away. Beckley quotes the recent paper, Current Understanding on the Cambrian Explosion, Questions and Answers, as hand-waving away the alleged immense difficulties of the Cambrian Explosion. But for some mysterious reason, Beckley doesn't bother mentioning this sentence. The combination of the body and trace fossil record demonstrates a progressive diversification through the end of the Neoproterozoic well into the Cambrian. Interesting, huh? Beckley then makes the absurd claim that 10 million years isn't a long time, biologically speaking. Nearly all of the animals present in the Cambrian explosion were invertebrates, and many invertebrates live less than a year, or a few years at most. If you assume an animal's lifespan is exactly one year, then that means they underwent at least 10 million generations in that time. Beckley quotes a bunch of researchers as saying the time of greatest diversification in the Cambrian was short, as in at least 10 10 million years long, and that the Cambrian explosion was a real event. I didn't argue against either of those points. Then Beckley says a recent paper argues that the Cambrian explosion must have occurred in just 410,000 years. While that is indeed very short, let's look at what the article actually says. For one thing, it notes, simple Ediacaran type traces are represented by Helminthopsis, which are also known from older strata of the Huns member and the Nudaus formation, as are the non or poorly mineralized body fossils, Gaugiashania and Shanksalithes. These fossil assemblages indicate a progressive rise of more complex organisms, peaked by the advent of complex and burrowing metazoans responsible for the successive reduction in the extent of microbial mats above a 547.36 plus or minus 0.23 million year old ash. And then, our new age data provide for the first time a precise absolute timing for this evolutionary turnover during the Ediacaran Cambrian transition. Accordingly, the age of ash 5, 538.99 plus or minus 0.21 million years, predates the termination of the Ernietomorph Pteridinium simplex and Rangiomorph Swartpuntia germsi in unit D at meter 104. The first appearance of Cambrian-type ecosystem indicators, including Streptichnus narbonii, can now be dated at between 538.99 plus or minus 0.21 million years, ash 5, and 538.58 plus or minus 0.19 million years, ash 6. Thus, the extinction of the Rangiomorphs, Ernietomorphs, and the beginning of the Cambrian radiation occurred within a short period of 410 plus or minus 400,000 years, given by the age difference between ashes 5 and 6. Then the paper goes on to explain the exact same data that I referred to in the Meyer video about the ecological turnover and success of the early Cambrian animals. Nothing in this paper refutes what I've said previously. Beckley then completely jumps the gun and says Farina claims that Meyer is dishonest for saying that many animal phyla show up for the first time in the Cambrian. That's the literal opposite of what I said. I even showed multiple studies about how many phyla appeared in the Cambrian. Beckley is out of his mind.
Next, my point about Phyla being arbitrary is correct, according to Beckley himself, but that's somehow irrelevant. Of course it is, Gunter. My argument was based on a 1999 paper by paleontologists Graham Budd and Soren Jensen, but that's just details, apparently. Beckley rounds this one out with a truly baffling statement. He says this about the definition of body plan that Budd and Jensen provide. Their definition is not only nonsensical, but objectively erroneous, as it would imply that, for example, the body plan of vertebrates does not include vertebrae because those are synapomorphically shared and not simplesiomorphically shared by all vertebrates. Well, that's just wrong. All extant vertebrates are descended from a common ancestor who also possessed vertebrae, meaning that vertebrae are an ancestral character shared by all extant vertebrates. This includes hagfish, even though they've secondarily reduced their vertebrae. Since all extant vertebrates have vertebrae, or the remnants of them, their common ancestor must have them too, and it's extremely unlikely that their common ancestor was the first individual to have some sort of vertebrae, implying that their there are stem vertebrates who would have had vertebrae prior to the last common ancestor of all extant vertebrates. As an analogy, think of tetrapods meaning amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Tetrapod means having four limbs, but four limbs were developed long before the last common ancestor of that group arose. Ichthyostega, Acanthostega, and Tulerpaton had four limbs but were stem tetrapods, not crown tetrapods. Such ends the second Beckley failure. The third one continues running defense for Meyer. Beckley starts by saying that it's a straw man to claim he said that the major animal phyla appeared in the Cambrian with no discernible antecedents. But that's exactly what he claimed in his PragerU video. Maybe go watch it, Gunter. Beckley says that all the animal fossils known from the Precambrian are both suspect and totally irrelevant to Meyer's point, even though that is exactly the point. If you say that there are no antecedents of the Cambrian animals, but have to ignore the various bilaterians, stem bilaterians, cnidarians, and sponges of the Ediacaran to do it, then you're just lying. Beckley says that the evidence for sponge stearanes is suspect, citing this very long copy-paste of Antcliffe, Callow, and Brazier's 2014 paper. However, at least one aspect of their paper is outdated, which is a perfect example of how science works. The authors cite an article on the genetics of bacteria associated with sponges called porobacteria that seemed to indicate these bacteria also had the genes to make the sponge stearines. As it happens, the bacteria don't have the genes, as that notion was evidently due to a genome assembly error pointed out in a 2016 paper. Try and stay up to date, Gunti. He then cites a 2021 article which claims that the sponge stearines may have been produced by the geological alteration of algal sterols. While this is a possibility, it has been largely refuted in a 2022 paper. The author points out that experiments producing these altered algal compounds have problems with quantity. They can't produce enough altered stearine to match what is actually observed in the Oman rocks. The paper conclusively notes, this means that there must have been organisms present in the environment that produced these distinctive sterols as a major fraction of their total lipid assemblage. So far, only some demo sponges are known to produce 24 IPC and 26 MES precursors as major sterols. No other studied organisms produce these molecules in amounts that are truly relevant to the rock record. While it is possible that other organisms with now extinct lineages could have produced the lipid precursors in relevant amounts, of the organisms that we know could have been present in the Neoproterozoic, demo sponges make the most sense as the source of these biomarkers when we consider the mass balance problems. Maybe Beckley should have done his homework. Next, Beckley tries to refute animal affinities for essentially every Ediacaran organism I mentioned. I said that Lantianella is a disputed animal, and this is true. Its affinities are debated. However, Heyusha is pretty universally recognized to have been a Cnidarian, and the recently discovered Aurora Lumina is also considered a crown Cnidarian. Beckley admits this, but says it doesn't matter anyway, because Meyer accepts the existence of Ediacaran animals. You know, except when he doesn't. First animal forms, first animal forms, first animal forms. Remember, Beckley is trying to get the readers to forget that Meyer explicitly said no animals are known from the Precambrian. We have him on video saying it. 
Beckley says that the embryos from the Deschanteau shale don't matter for the same reasons, and that the researchers are simply wrong about the embryos' affinities. Again, because reasons. He literally gives no justification at all for declaring the authors wrong. Beckley points to a recent paper that argues at least Megasphera is a protist, and they might be right. I mentioned before that the embryos have been argued to be protists. The debate is ongoing. But even if this is true, it doesn't make all the other Precambrian animals go away. Further down, Beckley lies by saying no phylogenetic link has been established between the organisms of these Ediacaran biota and the Cambrian animal phyla. He says this both after stating that Aurora lumina is a possible animal and before citing a 2022 paper that argues all the organisms I mentioned in the Meyer debunk are in fact animals. So by Beckley's reasoning, even if these organisms are animals, it doesn't matter anyway. Beckley turns to Charnia next, trying to argue for a macroalgal affinity, but I refuted this in the Meyer debunk. A 2021 paper points out, algae do not display a conserved form, and fungal fruiting bodies do not display the maintained differentiation of new elements. That means it cannot be macroalgae unless Beckley has access to some macroalgae that nobody else does. Beckley says the statistical support for charnia within crown animals is only 77%. Technically, the researchers did get 82% for a different topology, but yes, that's rather low for a phylogeny. However, that also means it's far higher than any of the topologies in which charnia isn't an animal. Maybe more fossils will come along in the future to resolve this. The final four taxa that Beckley tries to hand wave away are Tribrachidium, Dickinsonia, Icaria, and Kimbarella. Tribrachidium is a debated organism whose affinities have ranged from independently multicellular protist to stem animal, and it's still being debated. More fossils are needed to firmly establish its affinities. As for Dickinsonia, yes, again, its affinities have been debated, but to quote a 2022 article, as is well known, the body of Dickinsonia costata was constructed from segments, isomers, units or modules, which appeared at an unresolvable size at the posterior end and continued to grow and change shape during the life of the animal. This alone is a feature of animals rather than plants, kelps, or fungi. Citing Gregory Redelac again to argue for a lichen affinity is a non-starter, as shown previously. Even if Dickinsonia were a Cnidarian, Placozoan, or a member of some other non-bilaterian phylum, it's still considered an animal. To say it yet again, Meyer said that no animals are known from the Precambrian. Beckley then spews the same exact lie that I corrected last time regarding Icaria. He says that the authors of the original Icaria study ignored the idea that protists create helminthoidic nites like tracks on the deep sea floor, but this argument was explicitly refuted by those authors, as I showed in the first Beckley debunk. Beckley is just lying again. The only modern organisms that produce helminthoid ignites like tracks are bilaterians, making Icaria a bilaterian. He then admits that both Kimberella and Yelingia are animals, but you guessed it, it doesn't matter anyway. This constant reassertion that nothing matters unless we can find direct ancestors is abject nonsense and deflection to avoid the fact that animals are known from the Ediacaran. Beckley acknowledges that Claudina is an animal, though he says it might be a Cnidarian. He says Eulingia is questionable because it has a metameric pattern, but doesn't offer a comment on what he thinks it is instead. However, its size, segmentation, and the fact that it was found dead in its own tracks are directly indicative of animal and probably bilaterian affinity. Lastly, the pyrotized gut of Namacolathus indicates its bilaterian affinity. At the time of this writing, this doesn't appear to have been challenged by the paleontological community, and no, Gunter, you lying on a creationist blog free from peer review does not count. To summarize this one, Beckley acknowledges that quite a few Ediacaran fossils have animal affinities. He just doesn't care. He will only be satisfied with direct ancestors of Cambrian animals, which he knows are difficult, if not nearly impossible, to find. The point I made in the Meyer debunk is that even though many clades do appear in the Cambrian, they are preceded in the Precambrian by simpler animals, those being bilaterians, cnidarians, and sponges. 
we see that there were simpler animals in the Precambrian, and even though most or all of the ones we mentioned aren't direct ancestors of the Cambrian animals, that doesn't mean the fossil record doesn't show evolution or that animals were intelligently designed by God. There is a stepwise pattern of evolution in the terminal Precambrian going into the Cambrian. If Beckley wants to argue that God created successive waves of organisms to populate the Earth, that's his religious belief, not science. Moving on to the fourth one, Beckley discusses the Precambrian more broadly. Beckley first complains that Meyer couldn't possibly have known about the paper I cited last time because Darwin's Tao was written in 2013. Well, the videos I played were made a lot more recently than that, so Meyer should have been aware of at least some of them, unless Beckley is admitting that Meyer hasn't read any paleontological research in almost a decade. Pretty dumb for someone trying to publish books about the subject. Beckley also says that the embryos are supposed to have been a stage in the evolution of animals, but that's not what I said at all. I said the embryos are evidence of animal life, not that they are themselves ancestral to any other animals. Beckley hand waves the small shelly fauna away by saying that because there are two types of this fauna, they can't be considered as part of some transitional sequence. This is nonsense. The point with the small shelly fauna was that we have no shelled animals prior to their appearance in the Ladius Didiacrin, which is then followed by a radiation of animals with hard parts. The fauna are also preceded by animals lacking hard parts. The point isn't that Claudina is directly ancestral to Cambrian animals. No one is arguing that. Then Beckley contradicts himself. He both says that there are small shelly fauna in the late Ediacaran, but that their affinities are unknown, and that there aren't late Ediacaran small shelly fauna. Which is it? Are there or aren't there? According to a 2019 paper I cited, there are biomineralized fossils in the late Ediacaran. Their biomineralized parts may not have exactly the same chemical composition as the later fossils, but that doesn't detract from them forming a link from earlier organic walled fossils to later biomineralized fossils. Should we throw out all the different phytoplankton that differ in their chemical composition? Are some foraminifera not related to others because they incorporate more aragonite than calcite into their tests? Beckley then says that a 2016 study by Mariotti et al. contradicts everything we know about trace fossils. But it doesn't. The paper correctly points out that some trace fossils can be attributed to cyanobacteria or some other unicellular organism, but that wasn't ever in dispute. In fact, trace fossils attributed to Kimberella have been argued to have resulted from microbes. However, this is far from the case for all ichnotaxa. A 2020 paper, which cites that 2016 paper, takes a critical look at the ichnotaxa record of the Ediacaran, saying, for instance, the presence of Torowangia, an ichnogenus showing evidence of active infill, indicative of a gut, suggests the presence of an internal cavity, e.g. coelom, and possibly peristalsis to penetrate into the substrate. And a 2019 paper says, Commonly preserved levees indicate that the Helminthoid ignites progenitor was capable of moving through and displacing sediment. This necessitates that the organism that made Helminthoid ignites moved in a particular direction, signifying anterior-posterior differentiation and likely had a hydrostatic skeleton. These features demonstrate that Helminthoid ignites and similar contemporaneous trace fossils represent the earliest definitive evidence for bilaterians in the fossil record. In other words, researchers are aware of the Mariotti et al. paper, but no one seems to think that all Ediacaran trace fossils were produced by microbes. Hyping up this one article is just sensationalism. Beckley even goes on to mention the aforementioned 2020 paper and cites the authors saying that new biological architecture appeared in the Cambrian. Again, no one is arguing against that. Beckley says that the increase in ichnotaxa across the Cambrian boundary doesn't look stepwise at all. But is he blind? There is a large increase in ichnotaxa correlating with changes in ecological and ocean chemistry. And wouldn't you guess I said exactly that last time? It's almost like Beckley is saying the same thing I said, but just trying to throw in that it's too fast for evolution without any justification. Again, the alternative is that God created successive flora and fauna to populate the earth. Is that what Beckley thinks happened? Will Beckley ever say what he thinks happened? Or anyone at the DI for that matter? Beckley cites a 2018 paper on burrowing ichnofossils in the late Ediacaran called Aranicolites. 
a feature which makes them probable by Lateranians, but says they could be Nidarians, citing the possible Nidarian Gao Jiashania. Beckley whines that the authors of that recent paper don't take Beckley's consideration into account. And why would they? A reason they probably didn't is that the tubes of Gao Jiashania and other Nidarian tube-like fossils are regularly lined with rings, but the Arenicolites burrows aren't. Why Beckley would even bring this up is a mystery. Beckley finishes his article on the so-called worm world fauna. He hand waves them away by saying that term isn't used very often, as though that somehow invalidates the paper's conclusions. He closes with a quote from a 2018 paper that says no animals are known from Burgess shale-type deposits in the Ediacaran or the Duchanteau shale. That means no animals are known from the Ediacaran? Gasp! But no, Burgess shale-type deposits are a specific mode of preservation, which is indeed rare in the Ediacaran. To quote a 2016 paper, preservation of soft-bodied organisms is exceedingly rare in the fossil record. One way that such fossils are preserved is as carbonaceous compressions in fine-grained marine sedimentary rocks. These deposits of exceptional preservation are known as Burgess shale-type deposits. During the Cambrian period, BST deposits are more common and provide a crucial view of early animal evolution. The earliest definitive fossil evidence for macroscopic animal-grade organisms is found in the preceding Ediacaran period. BST deposits from the Ediacaran are rarer and lack conclusive evidence for animals. And a 2019 paper says, The most distinctive Ediacaran remains, however, are casts, molds, and impressions of soft-bodied organisms preserved in siliciclastic and, less commonly, carbonate rocks. Since these aren't carbonaceous compressions, they aren't Burgess shale-type deposits. But also, that 2018 paper is about the evolution of Euarthropoda, which it argues originated in the Cambrian. So Beckley is trying to spin an article talking about a specific type of deposit into a statement on the whole of the Ediacaran. Very dishonest, Gunti. To summarize this article, it's just Beckley ignoring more data he doesn't like. The fifth one begins with a staggering admission. Beckley says the intelligent design camp neither has a model of what happened in the Cambrian, nor needs one. He lists off a bunch of examples in which people have had to determine whether some phenomenon was produced by intentional actors or not, but this completely misses the point. Arguments for intentional design are statistical ones. In a 1983 paper, researchers argued over methods for how to tell designed objects from non-designed objects in the fossil and archaeological records. It is by no means a simple task. If we receive a rhythmic signal from outer space, does that necessitate aliens sending us a message? Of course not. Pulsars exist. And we could question whether or not SARS coronavirus 2 was altered in a lab, although that hypothesis hasn't received much support from the scientific community so far. Each of these issues has to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis, which undermines the point that Beckley is trying to make. Furthermore, I have to ask again... Which of the Precambrian and Cambrian animals were designed and which weren't? Were none of them designed? Were all of them designed? Beckley says ID proponents can accept common ancestry, and that's true. However, whence cometh the designer? Can you point to a specific set of nucleotides that must have been input by the designer, or an ecological niche that was specifically designed? No, Gunter, you can't. And you know you can't, so it isn't science, it's religion. Skipping down a ways, Beckley says that bryozoans actually appeared during the first phase of the Cambrian explosion, not the second, so aha, he got me. Beckley claims I'm a sloppy researcher for not knowing this, since this apparently debunks my claim of the first phase of the Cambrian explosion being dominated by stem lineages. But what's this? According to the very paper Beckley cited, the fossil bryozoan Protomelissian gatehousei is a stem bryozoan? Oh my goodness, whatever will I do being right again? Sure, it would have been more accurate to say crown bryozoans appeared in the second phase, so let's clarify that now, but it's hilarious to watch Beckley pull gotchas out of thin air to fabricate the illusion of correcting me when he is just embarrassing himself even further as he is continually corrected by someone who doesn't even work in this field.
Beckley tries to salvage Meyer's credibility by saying that the experts changed their minds on the Great Ordovician Biodiversification event being a single dramatic event, so it's not really Meyer's fault he got it wrong. Beckley keeps pointing to the existence of adaptive radiations as though that somehow refutes evolution. They don't, and that's a really dumb thing to say. Beckley says that actually Gobi fits in with intelligent design too, even though the body plan definition that Meyer gave doesn't apply to it. So again, what's your model, Gunter? Did God have a hand in every single adaptive radiation in Earth's history? Do you believe that? Is the reason you won't say it that you know everyone who isn't your science illiterate brainwashed audience will just laugh at you? Then Beckley says that the evolution of Cambrian and Ordovician organisms is upside down, but it isn't. This is wrong. To quote a 2005 paper, In a universe of possible designs, without prime regard to phylogenetic origin, was Gould correct in asserting that the Cambrian forms occupied a larger volume of morphospace than living animals? Does the evidence of the Burgess shale animals invert the conventional cone of increasing diversity? This turned out to be a hard question to address, not least because of the difficulties of quantifying design. Of the Cambrian faunas, the arthropods are perhaps the most obvious group to use in tackling this question because they exhibit striking differences in appendages and tagmatization. Wills et al. 1994 used principal component analysis to determine the distribution of a range of living in Cambrian arthropods pods in morphospace, supplemented by a variety of measures of disparity, and concluded that there was no difference in morphospace compass between Cambrian and recent faunas. The cone of increasing diversity was not inverted, but might be represented rather as a tube, with a diameter that remained roughly constant following its establishment in the early Cambrian. There was certainly no evidence for greater disparity of design in the Cambrian. Beckley then points to some recent articles that show the earliest evidence of clades like the acelomorphs, flatworms, nematodes, and nemertaeans in the Ordovician, so they clearly show the origin of new body plans in the Ordovician. Sure, those cases would be evidence of new body plans originating in the Ordovician, but again we have to wonder, does Beckley think God created those phyla in the Ordovician, or did they evolve naturally? The fossil record of rotifers starts in the Eocene, so did rotifers really evolve in the Eocene? Beckley says that there was an increase in diversity on the family level, which means more than speciation was going on, but he provides absolutely no citations for this ludicrous assertion. On the origin of insects, Beckley notes that Rhyniagnatha has been moved to the myriapods and isn't closely related to insects. That's fine, I noted in the Meyer debunk that Rhyniagnatha isn't associated with any explicitly insect characteristics. It should be noted, however, that the paper Beckley cites says, In summary, we cannot fully exclude an insect affinity of R. Hursti, as the specimen is very incomplete and the supposed key characters of the mandible are at best difficult to observe. Yet, given the observable characters of the structures surrounding the mandible, a myriapod interpretation is, in our view, better supported. The same paper points out that the oldest hexapod, the clade containing insects and their closest relatives, is Rhyniella precursor, which is the same age as Rhyniagnatha, so my point still stands. The point, by the way, since Gunter doesn't seem to get it, is the congruence between phylogeny and stratigraphy, which is explicitly predicted under evolution and not intelligent design. Beckley says, Darwinian evolution would predict a gradual stepwise origin of insect wings from wingless ancestors via thousands of transitional forms. This garbage again. Our inability to find fossils of every single organism that ever existed is not evidence against evolution, Gunter. And stop calling it Darwinian evolution. This isn't the 1860s anymore. How many times do I have to expose your dishonest usage of that term? Beckley then hand waves the genetic evidence for how wings arose by saying macro mutations may have been involved which necessitate intelligent design. That's just a bald faced lie, and Gunter knows it. He knows the current evolutionary synthesis has incorporated macro mutations for decades, and pretending otherwise is just dishonest. He also says the origin of wings isn't completely worked out, and that isn't surprising. More research on it is definitely needed, none of which will come from the Discovery Institute. 
Beckley drones on about how the amniote egg is different from amphibian eggs and that I missed it, but who cares? I was responding to Meyer's claims about clades suddenly popping into existence. I wasn't covering every single transition in history. Beckley says a recent article on dinosaurs proves they had an instantaneous origin, except the paper says the exact opposite. According to the paper, dinosaurs appeared at least 10 million years before their major diversification event in the late Triassic and are preceded by earlier archosauromorphs. Do you ever get tired of spinning the same lies, Gunter? Beckley finishes this one with turtle evolution. He says that both Unotosaurus and Papachelis have been moved to clades away from turtles, negating their position as turtle transitional fossils. However, the paper also says that turtles instead evolved from Pereosaurs, with some Pereosaurs like Anthodon being more closely related to turtles than other Pereosaurs, and that the authors even found another transitional turtle fossil, Chinlecheles, from the Triassic. This means that turtles are still found in the fossil record after their supposed ancestors by the very paper Beckley cited. Beckley's sixth and final infantile tirade on the fossil record begins by claiming that because there is controversy about the positions of the feathered theropods I mentioned, Aurornis, Anchiornis, and Joutingia, they're no help to the origin of birds. It's true that there's controversy over these fossils, and it actually makes perfect sense. A prediction of evolution is that clades converge in their morphology and genetics as you approach their common ancestor. It's no surprise, then, that it's so difficult to tell the difference between early scansoriopterygids, dromaeosaurs, oviraptorosaurs, and avialans. However, a 2020 paper puts all three of those fossils in a clade sister to all other avialans. There will probably be more debate on this topic, though. Beckley again repeats the lie of a temporal paradox between birds and theropods, but I refuted this earlier. Beckley both says the homology of feathers and scales has been refuted, but also that they're homologous on a very deep level. It's true that feathers didn't directly evolve from scales, and I didn't say that they did. With regard to the marine fossils, he only tackles the ichthyosaurs, saying that the Hupasuchians and Cartorhynchus aren't enough to satisfy him. Interestingly, the 2014 paper he cites shows phylogenies in which Hupasuchians and ichthyosaurs fall within a clade of already aquatic marine reptiles. Regardless of which tree is correct, Hupasuchians are still morphological intermediates between ichthyosaurs and earlier reptiles, and are both themselves descended from earlier at least partially marine reptiles. Beckley indicates that a 2016 paper says ichthyosaurs evolved from terrestrial reptiles in just one million years, but that's not what the paper is saying. It says that ichthyosaurs diversified within the first million years of their existence. Regardless, a paper recently came out that dramatically alters the timing of ichthyosaur evolution. The ichthyosaur described in that 2016 paper, Sclerocormus, dates to 248.8 million years ago, but a fully marine ichthyosaur specimen described in a 2023 paper paper named PMO 245.975 dates to 250 million years ago. The researchers therefore conclude that ichthyosaurs actually evolved prior to the Permian-Triassic mass extinction event, but didn't radiate significantly until after. Beckley then turns to flowers and ironically cites an article that says, Darwin's abominable mystery, which was really just about eudicots, not all flowers. Did he not expect his audience to look through his citations? Oh, I forgot, they don't even read these blog posts. Also, I pointed out in the Meyer debunk that there has been debate around which fossil groups are related to angiosperms. I didn't say any of these groups are the direct ancestors of angiosperms. More data is needed to confirm the group ancestral to angiosperms. And I didn't confuse Gigantopteriales with Glossopteridales. I pointed out that these are both groups which have been considered to be related to angiosperms. The latter group still is, even according to Beckley. But a 2021 paper considers Glossopteridales, Pentoxylales, Benetitales, Catoniales, and Petriolales to be stem angiosperms. Beckley is just trying to deflect. Oh boy, look here, we finally get an admission that Meyer said something wrong. According to Beckley, Meyer meant to say crown group Eutheria, the placental mammals, appeared in the Eocene. Just a minor oopsie. After all, Meyer isn't a paleontologist or zoologist, and he certainly isn't a biologist either. Weird how he writes entire books about those subjects, trying to overturn scientific consensus then, huh?
Anyway, hilariously, crown eutherians didn't appear in the Eocene either. In fact, they date to at least the Paleocene, the epoch before the Eocene. In the Paleocene, we find the stem primate Plesiodapus, the stem proboscidean erytherium, the stem perissodactyl phenacodus, and many other mammals. And unsurprisingly, we find stem eutherians in the preceding Cretaceous and even late Jurassic. So Beckley just bombs. But he also bombs according to his own chart. He shows a chart with a yellow bar that he added, representing the first fossils of different placental mammal clades. I guess Beckley's hoping his audience doesn't look up when the Eocene was, because according to him, his bar represents 62 to 49 million years ago. The Eocene started 56 million years ago. So Beckley is giving an extra 6 million years to the time period that Meyer stated. If only peer review existed for crappy creationist blogs. Then Beckley moves on to the part where Meyer really looked like a complete moron, genetics. And he is not joking when he says genetics isn't his field, as he ends up looking just as dumb as Meyer. He says, I don't understand evolution because somehow accumulating random changes or mutations equates with natural selection. How idiotic. There's no way that anyone familiar with this field would be foolish enough to confuse the process of mutations occurring with the selection of mutations by environmental factors. This is one of those moments where one has to conclude that the DI are indeed always lying on top of just being stupid. Speaking of lying, Beckley then quote mines theoretical physicist David Deutsch as saying, One thing that always seems to happen with such projects is that after they achieve their intended aim, if the evolutionary program is allowed to run further, it produces no further improvements. This is exactly what would happen if all the knowledge in the successful robot had actually come from the programmer. This is why I doubt that any artificial evolution has ever created knowledge. What's in that pesky ellipsis, you ask? Let's find out. The quote comes from his 2011 book, The Beginning of Infinity, and fully states, This is exactly what would happen if all the knowledge in the successful robot had actually come from the programmer, but it is not a conclusive critique. Biological evolution often reaches local maxima of fitness. And on the page before, Deutsch says, It certainly constitutes evolution in the sense of alternating variation and selection. Gunter deliberately omitted important context to pretend he was saying the opposite of what he was actually saying? Gasp! I can't believe it. Beckley then quote mines yet another paper as though it's arguing that mutations only degrade genetic information, and that evolutionary biologists really don't have an explanation for how evolutionary novelties arise. You know, the dumb script from Michael Behe. Shockingly, the very next sentence after the one he cited is, Now empirical evidence establishes the crucial role of non-random genetic content editors, such as viruses, diversity-generating retro elements, and other RNA networks to produce new genetic information, complex regulatory control, inheritance vectors, genetic identity, immunity, new sequence space, evolution of complex organisms, and evolutionary transitions. Funny how he didn't show that part, huh? He also cites theoretical biologist Gerd Mueller as saying that mutation and natural selection can't explain everything in evolutionary biology, which we've known for decades. As I have talked about several times in my content, the DI continues to misrepresent modern evolutionary biology by ignoring all the other mechanisms we know of apart from natural selection, so they can pretend evolution can't explain observations. This is one of their primary lies, and they're never going to give it up, no matter how badly they're exposed for it. Beckley then tries to defend Meyer's statement that sequences which produce stable proteins are rare by saying that Meyer can play fast and loose with facts because he's talking to a lay audience. He doesn't have to be right, he just has to sound good. Astounding. Beckley calls my point about the variety of DNA polymerase sequences just a silly straw man, even though it directly refutes Axe's argument about the extreme rarity of functional proteins. Then Beckley tries to criticize the Lensky long-term E. coli experiment by saying that a more recent paper found there are lots of ways to evolve E. coli to metabolize citrate aerobically. No new gene functions are needed. 
Sure, but that wasn't what happened in the first place. The E. coli duplicated a couple genes and placed them under the control of a promoter that only operates in aerobic conditions. A novel gene function was never needed. That wasn't ever the point. Nor was whether or not one wants to call the SIT plus mutants a new species. It doesn't matter because species is an arbitrary classification scheme anyway. The point, which apparently needs to be spelled out, was that a novel phenotype arose due to mutations, and then this mutation rose to fixation in the population due to selection. That's evolution, Gunter, whether you like it or not. Beckley finishes this one with a very brief discussion of Hox genes, in which he says that evolution isn't just about rearranging existing Hox genes, but also involves the addition of new genes. No one ever argued otherwise. Hox genes play critically important roles in evolution and are shared among most animal phyla, but obviously new genes can come into existence through different methods, such as neo-functionalization, sub-functionalization, moving promoter regions, etc., all four papers Beckley cites either discuss common genetic toolkits among bilaterians or animals as a whole, or ways in which genes evolve completely naturally. How he thinks either of these topics are a problem for evolution is truly baffling. In the seventh and final post in his series, Beckley pretends to address the critiques leveled against the so-called waiting time problem. He has four points he wants to make here. The first is in response to the claim that nature doesn't have specific targets, which is true. Nature does not have specific targets when evolution occurs. Beckley then completely misrepresents this point by writing that I or biologists claim nature is totally random. No, nature is not totally random. Some evolutionary processes are best described as probabilistic, but others, like natural selection and non-random mating, are not random. It's right there in the name. So portraying this as a dichotomy between having a specific target and being completely random is a straw man. To review, the actual critique here is that there are often many ways to do a specific thing in a living system, whether it's some biochemical function, genetic regulation, whatever. There are multiple systems that could accomplish whatever it is we're talking about. That's the critique. Beckley goes on to say that this critique is invalid because it presupposes the existence of many potential targets, and that this assumption is contradicted by a paper from 2004 by Douglas Axe, another DI hack we will debunk later. Beckley doesn't seem to be aware that in that 2004 paper, Axe also assumed a specific target sequence and wasn't calculating the frequency of the function in question, just the frequency of that one specific solution to the problem. He's also ignoring direct experiments experimental evidence that random sequences can result in functional polypeptides and RNAs at high frequencies, and can even readily act as specific promoters. Interestingly, Beckley is probably aware of that last experiment, since it was cited in a 2021 paper he co-authored on the waiting time problem. So on this first point, Beckley misrepresents the scientific position and then cites a paper that commits the same error that was called out while ignoring direct experimental results that refute its central claim. He then says, I didn't consider coordinated mutations, saying that you often can't select for things until several correct mutations are present together. He's under the impression I'm arguing that selection is occurring at every step in the evolutionary pathway to whatever trait we're considering. But no, the whole point of the waiting time problem is that these mutations have to occur without selection for intermediate steps, and their critiques of this supposed problem address it on those terms. Then he writes this, Third, he claims that the waiting time problem implies that mutations occur in a specific sequence, which is simply false. This is a blatant misrepresentation of what I said. It's not that the waiting time problem implies that the mutations in question must occur in a specific sequence. It's that it requires that they occur in sequence, so long as recombination is excluded as a mechanism that's operating in the population we're dealing with, as is the case in the 2021 paper co-authored by Beckley. If you permit recombination, then the required mutations can occur in parallel and be linked via recombination. So basically, Gunter didn't understand what I said and is just repeating the thing I debunked. Pathetic. 
Beckley's final point is that recombination doesn't help and has already been studied in the context of the waiting time problem, citing a paper from 1998. He's ignoring the fact that I'm responding to his arguments based on his models, not those based on modeling from someone else 25 years ago. In the aforementioned 2021 paper on the topic, Beckley and his co-authors modeled asexual haploid populations and brushed aside the effects of recombination in the span of two sentences. And apparently they didn't think that this 1998 paper was all that important because despite referencing 66 papers, it was not one of them. Instead, rather than actually modeling the effects of recombination and directly seeing if their results hold, they conjecture that their results would apply to a sexual diploid model, humans, and cite two papers in support of this extrapolation, one from 1958 and one from 1966. This is both lazy and dishonest. They should know better, and a robust review of this paper would have identified this glaring problem and made the authors correct it. That brings me to the last point here. Beckley says his 2021 paper on this topic, published in the Journal of Theoretical Biology, was published because it is good peer-reviewed science. If that was actually the case, if this was actually something important and groundbreaking, then it wouldn't have been published in a journal that is more or less a joke. It's clear that this journal does not have reviewers who are specialists in all of the relevant fields reviewing their submissions. Population geneticists or evolutionary biologists would have caught the obvious problems in the 2021 paper. Using journals like this is a common tactic for creationists who want to get the credit for publishing in the real literature. Pick a broad generalist journal, get checked on your math but not your genetics or evolution. Alongside the Journal of Theoretical Biology, another favorite outlet was Theoretical Biology and Medical Modeling until it stopped publishing in 2021. If creationists had any confidence in their work, they'd submit their manuscripts to journals specializing in population genetics or evolutionary biology. Or maybe they have and get rejected every time. He wraps it up by whining about me stating that they all believe in a god of the gaps, which they objectively do, and that I make propaganda, which is what they do, and reiterating that I'm a dummy with no PhDs. And then don't forget this adorable postscript where Beckley mentions my debunk of him where I eviscerated his pathetic attempt to respond to my Luskin debunk and proudly proclaims that he has absolutely nothing to say about it. He just blindly proclaims it's nothing but misinformation and logical fallacies and runs away like a little child because he doesn't want to feed the trolls. Thanks for debunking me, Dave. We must be on to something. The delusional narcissism is off the charts. So that's it for this pathetic attempt to salvage the reputation of Stephen Meyer, which basically amounted to Beckley's citation bluffing for seven blog posts. You know, that thing they all pretended I was doing when I humiliated James Tour? He just references real science, lies about what's in it, and speaks with an air of undeserved authority, knowing that this is all he has to do for their dumb followers to blindly conclude that Farina is a stupid doo-doo head. Fortunately, for anyone who has the courage to watch me compare his claims about the literature to the actual literature, it becomes abundantly clear that it's nothing but lies, quote mines, and desperate damage control from this silly little German guy once more. Anyway, with Beckley doubly debunked, it's time to move on to some other DI charlatans, so I'll see you next time.